I'm Steve Sokol. I'm the president of the American Council on Germany, and it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to today's discussion about the socioeconomic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. This virtual event was conceived of by the team at the Thomas Mann House and is being carried out together with the WZB Berlin Social Science Center and the American Council on Germany. There's no denying that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated social cleavages as well as gender and racial disparities in Germany and the United States and indeed around the world. To explore the social and economic impacts of the pandemic, let me welcome our speakers. Jutta Almendinger is a well-known German sociologist. Her research interests focus on social inequality, the labor market, rising inequity in Europe, and educational reform in Germany. Since 2007, she has been the president of the Wissenschaftszentrum für Sozialforschung in Berlin, or the WZB. She's also a professor of sociology of education and labor market research at the Humboldt Universität Berlin. In 2019, she was a fellow at the Thomas Mann House in Los Angeles. Richard Reeves is a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, where he holds the John C. and Nancy D. Whitehead chair. He's also the director of the Future of the Middle Class Initiative and the Center on Children and Families. His research focuses on the middle class, inequality, and social mobility. A huge thanks to both of you for participating in this event today. And to guide us through our discussion, I'm delighted to introduce Birte Maya. She's an award-winning investigative journalist and senior producer with German national public television broadcaster ZDF. In addition to numerous awards, Birte has been recognized with a number of fellowships, including an Anna Maria and Stephen Kellen Fellowship from the ACG, and most recently, she was a Thomas Mann Fellow in Los Angeles, where she conducted research on equal pay, but her fellowship was disrupted by the pandemic. Before I hand over to Birte, there's one more thing. If you'd like to ask the panelists a question, please use Slido. You should be able to see the link posted beneath the live stream. Birte will do her best to include as many of your questions as possible. I look forward to an interesting discussion and Birte, the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve, and good morning to our viewers in the US and a good evening to our German audience. I'm Birte Meyer, and I feel very glad and very honored to have been asked to moderate this panel with Jutta here at WZB on my side and Richard Reeves in Washington, DC. Um, I go right into the discussion. In the beginning of the pandemic, one popular trope was that the virus does not discriminate it was even seen as an equalizer to society. One year later, it has become clear that this is not the case, neither in the US nor in Germany. We have seen severe effects on women, especially in the workplace. And I would I like to ask Jutta now, what has been the impact of COVID on women in Germany? Maybe you could give us a brief introduction. Yes, first of all, thank you very, very much for having me. Thank you very much for the Thomas Mann House. Thank you for the nice introduction by Steve Sokol. And uh, thank you very much that I may discuss with Richard Reeves. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And welcome to Germany in this very nice morning, probably Los Angeles time. Well. Yes, indeed. I mean, the pandemic was not a recession, it was a she uh, session, it still is actually. Women uh, lost uh, more jobs than men, they reduced their labor time more profoundly than men did, uh, they increased their time for care more profoundly than men did, and they had no other choices because schools were closed immediately, uh, starting in March, April uh, last year, and they sometimes opened and then they closed again, so it was just a mess and you could not shape your own life according to this. So uh, we found uh, that uh, women felt considerable stress, uh, that they took on a lot of responsibility, and that they also, over time, changed jobs to less prestigious job, less attractive job, and less jobs who really uh, go on to a career. So we uh, not only see 
differences according to gender increasing over time, we also think that they continue to increase once the pandemic is behind us. So um, that might come as a surprise actually to our American audience because Germany has the reputation of being a very generous welfare state and um, compared to other um, uh, countries in the world and certainly to the US, that holds true. Still, women are severely affected. Um, do we need a different approach to um, curb the impacts of the pandemic on women? Do we need a more feminist approach? Well, I mean, I don't think that the German welfare state is tightly connected to the fate of women, actually. I mean, uh, women uh, could increase their labor force participation due to schools, and uh, that uh, we extended schooling to kids below three. Uh, this has been uh, done just recently. It's not a long time ago. We have childcare facilities not open from six o'clock in the morning until late in the evening. Uh, so in terms of the welfare state, the German welfare state sort of works. I mean, we have this short work and things like this. All those measures work. But uh, in the very moment, uh, women and families are left alone with their children at home. I mean, they have to take a choice. They can either go to work and leave their children at home, which they most certainly won't do, nobody will do it, uh, or they stay home with their children, and then uh, they have to do both at the same time without a good digitalization of education in Germany, so we are behind in this as well, without home office possibilities in many, many jobs. Uh, so the only thing they can do is uh, to retrench from the labor market. And uh, so I wouldn't say that the German welfare system is a bad one. I would never say this. I mean, we went through the last couple of months uh, in very good terms, and uh, still we are not down at the bottom. But it affects women more than it does affect men. And has, been, has this been properly acknowledged by politics, or do we need different approaches there? Well, it's the very beginning. Uh, no word was exchanged about women uh, and not about uh, children as well. I mean, they closed the schools without really any discussion at all. I was invited by the uh, ambassador of French, and she said, could you please explain this to me, why they do all the things without any public discussion? at all, uh, and uh, though discussion started, uh, but it was not really taken on very seriously. We first had in the first couple of months all this applause for the system, relevant workers, those are primarily women as well, but this, you know, did not continue really, and they don't uh, get paid much better than they have been paid a year ago. And uh, well, and then we also applauded to the possibility of being able to work at home, mobile working. And we said, well, probably this will help women. Uh, this will decrease the gender care gap. It will decrease the gender uh, pay gap, uh, and probably also the gender position gap in Germany, which I found sort of strange because why should anything of this decrease once you work at home and become entirely visible? <laughs> Invisible, yes. Thank you for, the, for that introduction into the German. Let's move to the United States and uh, Richard Reeves. Um, you have done significant work on the middle class and also on the effects of COVID. Um, do we see different effects or a different impact in the United States on men and women? So first of all, thank you for the invitation to, to join you today. And just to check that you can hear me okay on the panel. Wonderful, excellent, Great. thank you. Um, so thank you again, and th thank you. It was a, it's a real honor to be with you today. Um, so I, I, the way I think I would put this is that the pandemic has acted like an X-ray you know, like a hospital x-ray exposing the fractures in uh, our societies and in different ways for different groups. Uh, and so, for example, in the US, um, the racial inequity has been a very big part of the story. Um, my own work suggests that black Americans uh, are dying at about the same rate as white Americans who are 10 years older than they are. So in other words, you know, there's a, and we know how important age is. So that's one example. Um, the labor market effects in terms of gender have been similar to the ones in Germany that Jörta was just mentioning. 
Um, we've seen a big drop in female uh, employment, uh, especially of mothers. I think that it's interesting. There's a couple of things I would point to. One is that the drop has really been among those with young children. Um, and so for those with children 13 and, and, and older, not so much change. And in recent months, we've started to see the employment of fathers of young children start to decline as well, not as quickly as mothers, but as the pandemic has worn on, um, the gender gap has become a little bit more complicated. Um, so there's initial shock that I think for the same reasons as in Germany, many, many mothers of young children were just, just giving up. I mean, they couldn't do it essentially. Um, and so that the question is, what will be the long run effects of, of that uh, on labor force participation? And I think we just, I honestly don't think we know yet. Um, you know, there's a pessimistic story, which is the derailment of women's careers and the, and the reinstitution of traditional division of labor will have a lasting negative effect on women. There's a positive story that the way in which we work has changed sufficiently that we're working from home and more flexibly. You know, five years from now, where will we be in terms of gender equality? I just don't know. And I think the other thing I would say, the, the only amendment I think I would make to the question is like, do we need a feminist approach to policy? Would be, I think we need a gender sensitive approach to policy. And maybe in the US a race, race sensitive one. And the reason I say that is because it's quite clear that there's a big challenge around the labor market and, and women's participation. It's really exposed the tensions that working mothers, if, if, really face. And I hope that that shock will lead to much better policy. In the US, we don't even have a paid leave policy, right? And so we, we're starting from a very different place. But I do have to point out that there are other ways in which the pandemic has gone the other way. So for example, a huge drop in educational enrollment for boys, uh, young men, right? There's a huge gap. So seven times as big a drop in college enrollment for young men as for young women. We also see much higher death rates for men than women. The life expectancy gap just grew in the US between men and women because men are so much more likely to die of COVID um, and so on. And so what I think that means is that when it comes to health, to education, to the labor market, we have to, we have to look at in what's become the intersectional way <laughs> is the, the buzz phrase now, which is to look at the combination of race, gender, and I would lastly say social class. The truth is that those with money in the US have done okay, men and women in the pandemic. Those without money have not done well. And so the social class gap has been exposed in even starker terms, I think, than the gender gap. But those all interrelate. <laughs> so uh, my final point will be, I've just done some work on black women raising their children alone in low-income jobs their kids' schools were most likely to close. They're doing jobs they can't do from home. They don't have a partner with whom they can share the care and, uh, and the earning. Um, and they don't have wealth accumulated so that they can just take a break from the labor market. And so there's a great example of an intersectional approach which looks at race and class and labor market and parental status. And I do think we need to look at it through all of those lenses at once. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. I'd be very interested to know, you just mentioned that men are sort of, I think it was seven times uh, 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 enrolled in college, seven times um, less than women. Can you, is that correct? That's the drop. That's, that's the, a drop. The, that's the fall. Oh, so, okay. So in the US, the, the enrollment rate for men into college is much lower than for women. I think it's true in Germany too. So, so there's a big gender gap in, in higher education in most countries now in favor of women. And, and, could you um, and that's for reasons we can maybe get into, but the, the figure I was talking about was the drop in enrollment in 2020. Female college enrollment didn't really drop in 2020. The women still enrolled maybe to work online and so on. And actually it turns out women are better at learning online than men, according to most studies. Um, uh, but the male one dropped by more than 5%. And in our two year colleges, the drop was 15% for men. Um, uh, and so you can see that in the educational sphere, the pandemic has hit 
appears at this stage to have hit young men much harder than young women. It's very early, but in the labor market, we've seen it hit women harder than men. We've also seen it hit black Americans more than white. And so I, I think I'm just attempting to say that none of these binaries do all the work for us, right? Um, we, have to, we have to look uh, at the combination of factors uh, if we're to see what's really happening. And the fall in male college enrollment in the US is a very big worry because once you're off track educationally, it's much harder to get back on. And so five years from now, we may well see that today's, I have a 19 year old son, he is enrolling in college, fortunately. Um, we may well see that that's had an impact on the earnings of young men uh, five years from now. We just don't know, um, you know, and I, and I think it's very hard to predict anything from this point. Uh, and if I may ask you, um, why is that so? Do we know the reasons for that sharp drop? Um, we don't. We know that men are less likely to enroll in the first place. Um, I suspect that it's because um, it may be that young men realize they're going to struggle in more of an online learning environment. You know, they may have just learned that. So that may be very sensible to just say, it's not going to work for me online. Whereas for young women, they maybe think it will work. It's not because of the labor market, they're not going into paid work by and large, because there isn't much <laughs> paid work for them. Um, it could be that they're more comfortable with the idea of taking a break, being at home, you know, um, you know, being in touch with their friends on video games. Um, it, We don't know. Um, we just know that young men have opted out of college education much more aggressively than women have so far. And again, they may catch up, right? They may all, more, they may all enroll next year, uh, all the ones who didn't enroll. But, but the history of education suggests that once people get off track, especially young men, it's a bit harder for them to get back on. So again, we just, I don't know if that huge drop in male college enrollment is bad for the future just don't know yet. And I think some of the same has to be said about some of these short-term labor market effects. We just don't know uh, where female labor force participation is going to be a year from now, let alone five years from now. We have reasons to worry about all of these things, but we also have reason to hope that it's an opportunity to really improve our policies. Jutta, I thank you. Richard, are you um, as optimistic that there's two sides to the story? Well, I have to be optimistic uh, that uh, things will change, but let me briefly comment on uh, some of those remarks. Uh, yes, we always also talk about x-rays and that it exaggerates its differences, which we have already seen before. And so we are saying in Germany that we didn't have a good head start in education, in particular for young men as well, uh, but also for young girls uh, living in poor, segregated areas with Uh, parents who do not uh, speak German or who are not educated such that they can compensate for the non-digitalized schooling world which we have here. So yes, it's not this one factor, those are many factors. And uh, you talked about uh, lone mothers and they are affected most. Uh, all figures show us. They are in the poor jobs, they work uh, p uh, fewer work times. I mean, it's just a mess and they are desperate They're really desperate uh, because they even can't give their children to their parents because this is not allowed and has not been allowed. And in Germany, things change very, very slowly. I mean, in this respect, the United States is much farther ahead in getting vaccinated and things like this. So uh, we also see, talking about heterogeneity, that of course there are families which are composed of two uh, people One being outside and having to do uh, their work uh, at a farm, at a factory or whatever. If this is a woman and the man stays at home and can work at home, can has mobile work, then the care relation changes considerably. Between the two lockdowns and the man has the possibility to return to work 
there was this fallback immediately. So they stopped, they decreased the care work, and they increased the labor force. Uh, so I do not think uh, that uh, this slight increase which we have and which we still see in the engagement of men for caring for homework, also for caring for the elderly, will stay on uh, given uh, the time we passed uh, this uh, corona crisis. I, however, think that we will see huge costs uh, in the career development of women. I lost many professional women of whom I was absolutely convinced that they will become the brilliant professors of the world. But during those 14 months, they decided, well, to go to more administrative work, to go to part-time. They could publish lessons, they could be foreign. I don't see any possibility that they are going to make this up. And the same happens to many uh, career track positions in which women have been very, very motivated, very ambitious, and uh, they also change jobs. And I don't think that this will uh, well, heal in a way. So, yes, I'm agreeing that you can't make those long-term predictions, but uh, in some areas of our professional life for women, I'm absolutely convinced that optimism is not at place. Now, turning to the school system, this and we all know this is very, very different in Germany. We have this vocational schooling, yeah. which is comparable to your community colleges. And here, men are affected also more than women for different reasons. I mean, this has to do that employers in the moment do not hire as many uh, men uh, because they don't have the jobs. Uh, so this is a very, very, uh, well, rocky career start in a way, but it most certainly is not the case that men are not applying. And in terms of higher college employment, non-vocational em uh, college uh, enrollment, I think uh, that we really do benefit that colleges, universities are free of charge so that you do not have to pay, that you do not have to take on loans. And uh, this is referring to our welfare state, of course, something which is really helpful. Can I, can I just say Ab one thing? Absolutely, one thing? please. Um, as fascinating. And, and I think what we're, we're both talking about in different ways is what economists call scarring effects. Yes, indeed. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is why I If I may interrupt briefly, could you explain to our, <laughs> to our um, audience, please? Yeah, so it's that um, a short-term uh, wound, if you like, being derailed from the labor market has long-term effects, so it leaves a scar. So it's called scarring effects because, you know, 20 years later, you can still see the scar. See, I have and we do, one. We do, doesn't right. oh, I, I, I do understand, <laughs> but... <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> I, I, I have one, but I'm not going to show you mine. Um, <laughs> And that's what we mean. So it's long-term effects from short-term shocks uh, is what we mean. And you see it from educational derailment and you see it from labor market derailment. And, and I think this interesting question, which is, you know, have we lost some time? It was interesting that the studies of academics in the U.S. found exactly the same, uh, Jota, as you said, which is during the pandemic, male academics were producing more papers. Uh, <laughs> female academics were producing less. And so, you know, we then have to see what happens. Everything else equal, that will damage women's chances. I wonder whether there'll be a sort of post-pandemic attempt to recognize that. That's what I hope. I hope institutions will realize that. Um, some signs of that now in the US. Oh, yeah? that we're so of could you tell saying, me, okay, this is really interesting. I'm here in a position where I can change things. So if you have good suggestions, I immediately buy them. Well, I think there's a, I think it's just, just treat that as a gap year. So nothing counts in that year, basically, or do you know, re, re weight people's citations, right? Uh, I mean, there's some evidence that men use paternity leave for that as well, which is a slightly different thing. The, the thing I was going to say is I think on the, on the family labor market front, which I've done quite a bit of work on, you know, I think the hopes for a radical shift in the distribution of labor between mothers and fathers which I have had for many, many decades <laughs> and attempted to live myself, they're just, we keep waiting. And the pandemic has just exposed how when the crisis hits, it was women, it was mothers who, who, who picked up the work, right? Um, I'm much more hopeful now about the redesign of jobs 
Claudia Golden's work out of Harvard and so on shows the problem is if you have these jobs where there are critical years, like there's a few years where you get more papers published or more clients, whatever, that changes your trajectory. As opposed to occupations like pharmacy in the US, highly paid, highly skilled, where there's almost no gender gap in pay because it's much more linear. You know, you work the hours. There aren't these critical periods. So the way we design career paths, the way we design jobs that seems to me to be where the real hope is for more gender equality. And maybe the pandemic will accelerate the redesign of jobs and the redesign of careers. That's, I think, the big hope. Do you well, think so? Uh, I, do you agree? May, may I yes, say, please I, do. I, this one I share. I mean, this I entirely uh, share because uh, for male professions, we would have had a huge transformation anyway. All those production workers, they have to be re-educated. And this is not a strong area in Germany. I mean, we learn at the very beginning of our life, supposing that it lasts for the entire life until we are in the grave in a way. So, and uh, we did not really find a good uh, solution to this. And then the corona started. So you have this interaction effect uh, between huge labor market transformations in addition to corona, uh, short time uh, labor and things like this. And so we do not know how this will work out for a particular group of men which have sort of a middle degree, low to middle educational degree is, uh, or occupational certificates. You may be right about this, but, uh, well, the one question is uh, whether or not uh, women uh, gain rights because they are well educated uh, and do better and uh, gain ground or whether they have to wait until men fail. And I always hope that this is the first pass and not the second one. I, I, I have a follow-up question to that. <laughs> it's been decades that we've seen the women's movement in the 70s, of course. Did this come as a surprise that women are still so vulnerable in the workplace? Not really, uh, because, uh, well, um, I wrote this little book looking at my grandparents, and then I tracked labor force employment and enrollment of men and women, and men actually didn't change. I mean, since 1900, uh, of course, they enter the labor market later due to educational expansion, and probably they leave a little later because they uh, increase uh, their life expectancy, but otherwise, Male life trajectories in Germany are like a rocket, or have been. Women changed considerably, but they changed given in, in 1900 or in 1956, there were few women in the labor force and they all worked full time, basically. Now we have many, many more women in the labor market, but they more or less all, if they have small children until the age of 16 or something like this, they won't work full-time, they work part-time, and it's extremely hard to change from part-time to full-time with some hope that you make a career, that you really end up in a top position. Uh, this is hardly possible, and this is a schooling out which uh, German women always experience. Yes, I, I, I think you. it's... I agree. I agree with all of that. I, I think that what the pandemic just exposed in this case was the fact that it was mothers, by and large, who were balancing paid work and care work, and fathers were not. So you get a care crisis, right? The pandemic created a absolutely monumental care crisis, and we closed the schools, and we didn't open them up quickly enough. Exactly. We didn't think about kids enough, and that had labor market effect because because the default it's like almost like you spring back to the, what's, the def, what's the default setting for the family. And the default setting for the family is that the mum does more of the care. So when everything went, when the earth, when the world got turned upside down, it was mums that ended up doing more of it. So that's why we see these labor market trends. I think the question is, do we see a bounce back to something better and we redesign our jobs? Or is this like, have we lost 40 years of progress and it's the end of the world and so on? And I just don't think we know yet. 
Um, and I, no, you know, I, we have to I have this conversation this and again. I stop predicting things, of course. I mean, you're an economist, I'm a sociologist. I mean, usually you uh, are daring to uh, look in the future and I'm more conservative. Uh, it's very difficult but, uh, to predict the future, actually, as someone said. You know, I mean, so from my knowledge from the United States, uh, I'm sort of a little bit surprised, at least, because in the United States we have many more families in which women work more than men do and that women earn more than men do. So that a household is really dependent on the female labor force participation. So I thought uh, that uh, the changes over time, over the pandemic, are not as strong as we have seen them in Germany. Yes, I, I, that's true. And I also says 40% 40, 40 of US households have a female breadwinner. Yeah, see, right? I mean, as, this as is considerable. I mean, it's unseen yeah. here. Yeah, um, but the huge, the huge transfers of money that went to families from the US government, to their credit, um, really helped on that front. Uh, and many of those are lone parents as well. That's not just um, couples. But it is this point about the division of labor, which we've, we've talked about and around care. You know, I've been looking recently at same-sex couples, in particular women, um, where you see similar gaps in pay exactly. opening up um, because if one stays home to care. And so what happens is that we put gendered assumptions onto a division of care, which results in these pay gaps. It turns out you get the same, a similar pay gap in lesbian couples, actually. Yes. Um, if they only have one child, it's just that they will then typically have another child with the other mother. <laughs> Whereas with a heterosexual couple, it's always the mother having the kid, <laughs> right? Um, and so what this means is our care infrastructure is just 40 years out of date. At least. We're still, we have uh, workplace care policies designed for a world which has gone. And we've all so impatient to wait for it. We've all been waiting. When are we going to catch up? So, Richard. Maybe now. <laughs> maybe. Is this an inflection so see, point? So, for me, then? this is really interesting because I hardly yes. have ever the chance to talk to a male uh, academic on those issues. So, yes. let me enjoy this uh, press situation. <laughs> Usually, I talk to women about it. In Germany, only that's, women work on very the problem, though, isn't it? <laughs> yes. I completely agree. We're very glad to have you here, Richard. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'd like to ask a question and let you talk and ask. Now. Is this an inflection point right now? Well, um, I've said this, we don't know. But my sense is that as we begin to return to normal, there's this new thing, there's this phrase in English uh, called FOMO, which means fear of missing out. There's a new one now, which is phono, which is fear of normal. Uh, and I think this fear of normal is really interesting. And I think a lot of people are questioning some of the ways in which we used to live and work. And, and I think that a lot of institutions are going to have huge talent problems if they don't change the way they work, if they don't offer more flexibility. And so I, I think it really could be. Um, I just, I don't know, but it feels to me as if there was ever going to be an inflection point around workplace flexibility and culture and gender and childcare and so on. If not now, then not in my lifetime. So that's, I'm either, I'm either very oh optimistic God. or very if pessimistic. Ask this, me again in a year. Hell, shall I say then? <laughs> <laughs> so you I mean, if not now, then when? <laughs> For Germany, is this an inflection point? Or you think, do we, do we have phone now? Fear of um, normal? I probably would, would not start at this point because flexibility for women always means uh, caring for children and working at the same time. Flexibility for men in Germany means something entirely different. It means that you can work at this cafe or at this place, that you can work in the middle of the night or all in the morning, that you can uh, work and do fishing at the same time. It's sort of the Marxian utopia. I mean, it's, it's very different. It's so gendered. I mean, this home working is really gendered. It means for women something different and women are locked at home. They're getting invisible from the public area and uh, men do not. But uh, I can share and I can also see this optimism and uh, probably I'm not so enthusiastic as he is. 
Um, because um, for the first time since I have an academic career, and I started my first professorship in 1992, so this is really a very long time ago, young women told me, well, we do not need quota, we do not need a feminist movement, we are strong, we are better than men in the colleges uh, and things like this. And now this has changed because last year together we worked, old women, young women, uh, women from all different sectors of the uh, society work together to get uh, things uh, done and uh, change the way uh, we think about women and as different groups, heterogeneous groups, not having a joint mission. And this is where my hope comes from, yes. And then there's, of course, the not so hopeful perspective, which you just mentioned, we're losing talent. We're losing women. You're losing women in, in academic careers. Um, is this going to be even maybe a, <clears throat> sorry, a hindrance to economic recovery? What, is it, what does it mean if we have a talent gap in the future? Well, I mean, uh, he yes. just told me that he uh, has some cure, you know, and that I had that he has some idea how they make up their publication record and things like this. But it's not just uh, students who suffer. It's, it's I'm, I'm primarily thinking about uh, women with children at the age of five, six, seven who usually would have returned to work and uh, now delay this return or go to part-time and change their ambition. I'm primarily concerned about this group of women together with women in poor jobs who are going to lose uh, their jobs. I think we have lost Richard for a moment. So um, let, let's stay in. Let's That's too bad. <laughs> Probably there was so much hope that I can discuss with a man. <laughs> no, I think, I think he'll be back on very soon. Um, what are the brief lessons or the main lessons to be learned from the pandemic one year, one year after so that we're not sitting here next year and debating the whole thing, the whole same issues again? What yeah, you but you started with this German welfare system and uh, <laughs> German welfare system is primarily created by political parties and uh, we uh, have elections, we have many elections this year and so my hope of course go that we increase uh, the time for partners to take out um, months for uh, caring, uh, this is now at two months, I think we could increase it to four months, we could change our tax system profoundly, which is quite different and is not to the very best of those uh, parties of a household which earn less money than the other one. We could uh, decrease uh, the jobs uh, which don't have any social security coverage. This would help women at all. We could expand our schools you know, to full-time school. This is long time overdue. So there are many, many things politicians could do immediately. And then we could also have, and this uh, goes back to what uh, he said, uh, we could really lay back and think, so what are the lessons we really learned? Is this really necessary to work 40 hours a week? Or could we afford to work 32 hours? Each partner change and share our work. And, uh, I have seen in some party programs, you know, this approach, not just appearing, but also spelled out. And this is where my hope comes from and my optimism. It's your optimism. So you're optimistic so in the year from now, I'm we're not, not going to well, talk about the yeah, same issues. Yeah. Hoping for the parties and hoping for all the women, that we have few women in the moment, but uh, I hope powerful and that they are writing the right programs. Okay. If you're wondering where, uh, where Richard Reeves went, I think we're trying to reconnect to, to Richard. Um, for now, we are here with Jutta. He's back. He's back? Yes. Richard, are you back? Not, not yet. In the US, I mean, oh, but this Richard, gives here he is. Yeah. See, Excellent. I told you. <laughs> Excellent. Jutta just told us that she is um, asking, asking uh, for sort of main lessons to be Hello. learned. Hi, hey, welcome back. <laughs> hey there. I thought that, that this was enough time for that she's yeah, I, to I, talk I to a male academic. She is uh, oh, optimistic. I'm are you? To, same. Are you with yeah. us? Are they, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I absolutely. Can, hear can they hear me? 
Okay, can you hear me too? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think they can hear me. <laughs> can you hear me now? No, uh, you're now on. Now it looks like they can see you. Well, I keep going on and off the screen, but... Ah, okay. Well, but, you know, I mean, if you talk, we, uh, this is... Yeah, not, not saying that this is sufficient, uh, but it, it, it would be nice if helpful. You know. It would be nice to know. Can you hear us, Richard? No, I think he can't right now. So <laughs> let's let's go. Let's let's have a sorry brief about this. outlook. No, just, I just no it's, all of I mean, a I'm the, I'm sorry about it. I wish I wish I could help. Um, I Maybe we should, um, but this gives me side. a moment to greet uh, all my uh, my uh, neighbors, which I had at the Thomas Mann House. Nope. I miss you. I really miss you. So, surely, if you watch, <laughs> I really do chat. miss you, and I hope that we can have our Thanksgiving party. Thanks, yeah. And now he's back. Okay, now we can see Richard, but apparently, can you hear us too? I've unmuted now. You no no no. You you're unmuted, and can you hear us as well? I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't hear us now. <laughs> Oops. So, so I ask for now. I, I, let's you know, just, Richard, one idea might be to watch the live stream. Um, let's just turn to Jutta. And Frauen sind absolut stressresistent. Frauen können multitasken. Maybe we could just have the speakers off for now while Stephen and Richard are talking to each other. So then we could continue the talk here. Uh, no, it doesn't look, doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like it. As soon, Richard, as soon as you can hear us. So for what, for what it's worth, up. I'll put the, the YouTube live stream in the chat. Okay. So All right. Well, if I get on that. But they, they won't be able to hear me, that's the problem. No, but at least you can hear what they're saying if there's a way of den, then bringing you back. Den Ton hier mal runternehmen? Ah, yeah. So there's a question I wanted to ask Richard, but since Richard is not online right now, <laughs> I'll, ask it to, I'll, I'll ask the question to you. What do, you think, do you think that Kamala Harris as vice president, first woman, is going to make a difference in terms of um, feminist politics? Of course she will make a difference. I mean, women hardly make any difference. Uh, so the question is uh, how far this difference uh, goes and, and how much she can move on. I mean, even in Germany, if we talk to small children, to girls in particular, asking them how you envision a chancellor, they keep saying, no, well, this is a woman. Uh, so women in powerful positions make a difference. This is why we are all going for quota. Uh, otherwise, this wouldn't make a lot of sense, actually, because it affects so few women and so many more women need our help. But uh, this visibility is something. This uh, perception that women can do it, that they want to do it, that they do it brilliantly, uh, that they can fight with men, uh, that they can survive, uh, all those things are human attributes and not male attributes. And of course, all women in powerful positions do help, yes. Okay, so there's another optimistic answer to, um, to But the we situation. have had, I mean, sorry, I mean, we have had Angela Merkel for many, many years now, decades, I could say. And, 16 uh, years, yes. She made a little bit difference, but she uh, did not make this difference, so there are sort of limits to optimism that uh, new women are coming up uh, and that we, uh, in our election day, will have the choice between uh, three or four female candidates, which we won't have. Absolutely. Backdrop. So so in case you're wondering, Richard Reeves has um, dropped out due to technical problems, but will be back on soon, I hope. We have questions from the audience, and I have them on the iPad when the stream doesn't work. Um, so I don't now, know it's my that. particular <laughs> pleasure, Birte, to yes. answer questions posed to uh, him. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, we need, I, I'm, I'm sure. Um, there's one very easy question from Anonymous. Does Germany need to address the image of the working mother? Die Rabenmutter, I suppose. Um, yes, of course. I mean, this is highly needed because, I mean, we have here a very a wonderful scientist, uh, Lena Hippen. She's running experiments. And uh, what those experiments still show is what I have myself experienced uh, 
now uh, 27 years ago, I mean that uh, women who are out of the labor market for 10 months are more likely uh, to be invited uh, to uh, a conversation with a future employer uh, compared to women who are out for two months. And if you then ask, well, why did you invite this woman with a long interruption and not the woman with a short one? Then we are told, well, this woman is too ambitious. Uh, she is not really taking care of their kids. And this is not really, you know, someone nice to have around. And this is a raven mother pure. So this is ingrained in... And now, but I know we have to be careful. I mean, we are now talking about West German women. And East German women are quite different. Uh, so in this history uh, survives even decades uh, after the fall of the wall. So careful about that. Yeah. I should be careful about that. Yeah. Richard, can you hear us? We can see you. Can you hear us, Richard? I'm talking to Richard Reeves, the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., and we can see him, but apparently he can't hear us. Hmm. So let's go to the next question on Germany. Another anonymous asked, will you expect ch changes for women in the labor force in Germany if the Greens join the next German government? What do you think? Because they're quite likely, for the American audience, they're quite likely um, to do so. Yes, I actually do think because the party program uh, entails a couple of things uh, which are very, very important. First of all, they have a high quota system. So uh, whenever Greens are in power, you see 50% women. This is a quota. And uh, they uh, also run jobs often together, which I also consider uh, to be a model for the future. Joint leadership positions, male, female. So this is the second thing. The third thing is that they uh, move towards uh, a 30 uh, to uh, our week, which will be very helpful as a new normal considered over the entire life. So you can have times in which you work much more, but then also times in which you work uh, less. And this will decrease uh, this harmful uh, gender care gap uh, tremendously. And uh, then they have a couple of other measures. Uh, I do not know whether they will work as much, like uh, decreasing the gender uh, pay gap, but this is in Germany a question of discussion between the unions and the employers. And uh, those uh, power of parties is not really strong in this respect, uh, but at least it's there. And uh, I also hope that they will really go on and uh, increase those partnership months uh, in taking care of children. Another question to Richard. Can you hear us now? We can see you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Welcome back. Very glad. Sorry, I'm really I was, sorry. I started watching the live stream, and I was, I was starting to put my answers in the chat on YouTube. So oh. I'm glad to be back. Oh, I, I am. No, I'm, I'm not. Oh, now you can double check, you know, what he has answered. No, he's, I heard he's, he's now back on, so please. No, you know, he's an economist. He's running an experiment with us. So, uh. so you, you, you have been with us, apparently, on YouTube. Thank you for, for following us and, and being creative and, and participating. Did you want to um, re react or comment on what Jutta had said while we were solving the um, technical problem? Um, I think particularly talking about what the cultural aspects of gender inequality is that they, yeah, I mean, again, I mean, actually, I'm, I'm not an economist by background, I'm a philosopher, but I spend my time among economists. And, and I think this issue of bias and of norms, around, you know, professional norms in particular, remains a challenge, no, no question. Um, you know, I think that as we've gotten better, the more of the gaps we see are explained by things like the care gap, which we talked about earlier, than they are by these kind of norms. But it doesn't mean we still don't have quite a long way to go. And in particular, like in, and I think you were talking about, you know, Angela Merkel, but in the US, of course, it's still considered to be a huge deal to have a vice president that's a woman first time yes. ever. And so particularly around these leadership roles, so we still see these quite strong kind of gender norms, Equally, we see very strong gender norms against men in care roles and in kind of or against homes. So 
so I do think these norms are still continuing to do quite a lot of damage to the cause of equality. And I think more now in some ways than some of the kind of older, more straight, the easier kinds of discrimination, if you like, these kinds of quote, soft forms of discrimination are in some ways more pernicious because they're harder to dislodge. Thank you. So the question I wanted to ask you before, <laughs> but you were out, unfortunately, is do you think like, Kamala Harris is going to make a difference as vice president? Because clearly there's a lot of hope as a woman in, with regards to feminist politics also regarding the impact um, of COVID on women. Yes. I, I mean, I, I have actually done some work using the World Economic Forum Gender Equality Index, um, which shows how far the US is behind other countries in terms of political equality. It does better on some other dimensions of gender equality, but very bad in terms of politics. And I compared the US to Canada and Mexico in particular. Mexico is way better than the US. Um, partly because they introduced quotas um, for parliament, which I support. Um, but the big factor in that, uh, in that index is, have you had a female head of state? Um, and of course the US scores zero. Um, by comparison to the UK where I grew up, you know, I grew up under Margaret Thatcher <laughs> as prime minister, and of course you have a queen, um, and Angela Merkel. And so for me, and Honestly, I think the, the election of Kamala Harris is carrying way too much weight. This is just, it was embarrassing before. It's less embarrassing now. But I think to ask her to single-handedly, not only as a woman of color, but as a woman to transform American politics is part of the problem that we have. As soon as a woman is in a leadership position, she's expected to kind of solve all these problems. And that just can't be the case. Kamala Harris needs to be, she should have been given more, a bigger role in the stimulus bill. That's the big question right now, which is what role is she being given? Um, and the danger is that right now she isn't being given a clear enough role. So it will depend on how she works and how President Biden works with her. There is growing concern in the US that she hasn't got a clear enough role. And that's always a problem for a vice president, but that's going to be a huge problem if she doesn't. So I, I you know, it's great that she's there, but unless she gets a substantive role, then I think the attacks will start to mount that it was just for, you know, it was for show rather than for substance. Thank you. We have another question from the audience and highest rated from Anonymous is, will we need some incentives to help women get back into the workforce after the pandemic, such as childcare subsidies, retraining, etc.? Richard, do you think so now that you're with us? Um, uh, I think it's too early to tell, uh, uh, but I think we should, but I think we should do it anyway. <laughs> um, I, I think I, I, the question is framed in a way, say, should we be doing, you know, doing more to support child care on in order to, well, we should just do it anyway, because we know that that was a barrier to women being able to, to be in paid work before the pandemic. So if the pandemic helps to make the political argument and the economic argument for not losing all this female talent, Great. <laughs> um, I don't know as a matter of policy whether or not we will need that um, particularly, but we should have it, uh, even if you can't justify it from the pandemic um, perspective. Um, but I, I will say again, I think that the truth is that what we want are policies to, for and care which help mothers and fathers and which cease to see childcare policies as policies that are only for women. You know, we've got to stop seeing these as women's policies and women's problems. <laughs> That's part of the problem we're trying to solve. I'm not saying that they, they are not. <laughs> I'm just saying that if we keep framing it that way, then we contribute to the problem. Thank you. There's, did you want to comment or do you want to? Yes, question? I also have an answer to this you, question. You I look, would uh, proceed differently, but you know, the goal would be the same. And I would uh, extend vouchers to men if they continue to stay at home for a couple of hours per day. And this also then would uh, equalize the time men and women spend uh, at home with their children, with their parents doing homework. And this should be, you know, the goal of all uh, efforts. Excellent. Subsidizing men for not working um this comes to yeah we do this with this long uh, with this uh, yes. short uh, term work anyway so we could simply continue it and uh, we have some money and it will pay off uh, I, I i agree there's another question pointing to that direction which is also anonymous unfortunately what is the role men should play in changing this situation who wants to start 
Oh, they should dare to do what they want to do. I mean, whenever we have huge surveys, those young men tell us they want to have, you know, a partnership of equal footing. They want to uh, share the work uh, for children. And, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, they, they look at the money at the table and then the decision is made ever so slowly to roll back to traditional gender roles. So, I mean, if they simply would have more courage to stay on and to do what they tell us that they want to do, a lot would have been gained, you know, and if they uh, take uh, dare to decrease their labor force participation a little bit from those 90, uh, 39 hours to 35, 34 hours, a lot would be gained, yes. So we help men to show courage. Very good. Richard, what do you think? Do you agree? Uh, Yes, I, I, I agree. I think the, the thing I would underline is um, to be fathers and to take fatherhood very seriously as a role in and of itself, independent of the role of husband. So we often will say husband and father, take care of yes. my family, right? Like it's a, sing like it's a single yes. package deal. But, but actually being a father directly, you know, direct relationship with the kids is, is we have good evidence that that's good in itself but it will change the way we think about the division of labor. Um, and I think will you know, help a lot of women and men to recalibrate their way they do um, family life. And so, and I think that's very important because the role of male breadwinner is, you know, quite rightly, you know, going out of fashion, maybe too slowly, but, but, but so in terms of male identity, there's something of a crisis now, which I think is driving a lot of these other trends that we see in politics and economics and education, which is what, what is, what, what's male identity now? And if, if we don't reinvent male identity in a positive way, then I think that we're going to struggle. And one of the positive ways to reinvent male identity is really around this role of fatherhood. Fathers are as important as mothers. Fatherhood matters. Even if you're not with the mother, father, father, you know, that's, that's a foundation upon which to, but I think going to men and saying, you should give all this stuff up. It's women's turn now. You should be a feminist. No, 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 this won't work. It won't work. No, I, I mean, of I, course I, not. Right? No. You've got to, it has to be a positive offer. And the positive offer Absolutely. is be Absolutely. fathers. And actually men are spending more time with their children in the pandemic, exactly. just not as much as women are. Exactly. And so maybe again, there's hope. Yeah. Okay, and Jutta recommended, the question of course is what works. Jutta recommended subsidizing men for not working. But of course taking, it will work. I mean, if you have no, the not political... For, for, for men not working and, and, oh. taking, and taking care of their fatherhood responsibilities, for example. Do you have any more suggestions how, we could, how politics could actually help father, or men reinvent male identities? Well, uh, first of all, I'll, I mean, I think there's two things. What, I love the radicalism of the idea. Um, about, I'd love to learn more about that. I'm, I have actually become in favor of leave for fathers, that if you don't take it, it you know, use it or lose it is how they describe it. Right? I didn't used to be in favor of that. I used to say, just leave it to the parents to decide. But I've now come to the view that we need more aggressive policy to persuade Fathers, and the evidence is they work, that fathers are more engaged, and you know the evidence better than I do. Um, this, I think, builds on that idea. This goes as this kind of a, you've, you've gone further, and, and I think um, yeah. said vouchers. But, but I do also think it's quite important that we don't age limit those benefits, right? Oh, so, yeah. Because I've come to believe that adolescence is a very important period in child development, and that actually, you know, so it's one thing, you know, how you do your family life when your children are one year old, and how you're doing your family life when your children are 11 years old and 15 year olds do not have to be the same thing. And I think there, you know, we could really pursue a bigger role for fathers, not only at the beginning, but also in adolescence, where I think fathers, you know, watch, I've raised three kids and I, t and I can tell you, it takes more than five years, right? It's a long business, so we need more. For, and then I the second thing, right? <laughs> politicians can, and you know, my wife and I did take it in turns, right? So, but it takes a long time. Also politicians. Do they take full paternity leave? How, of, how much time do male politicians take off when they have children, right? And, and unless we see more of an example being set, then I think it's hard for other people to follow. Yeah. Let me add a small point to this. So Please. in Germany, you know, uh, that we have those two months uh, which, uh, you know, are gone if the father doesn't uh, take them. Uh, the problem is that, oh, uh, 
positive, we want to be positive this morning, um, is that uh, more and more men really use this measure. So they are now on average taking three months off. But 92% of all men take those three months off together with the women. So uh, they wait until the kid is 11 months old and then the two of them travel around the world and write nice postcards, which is perfect for them, but it does not mean the same for the children and it does not give the responsibility to the father and uh, show them that they are able all by themselves to uh, raise this kid. Uh, so we have to do something uh, about that. That's fascinating. They should, so you're saying they should not be able to take it at the same time? Because no, it doesn't exactly. Yeah. This is why no. I'm usually saying yes. raise it to four months, uh, then yes. the chance is lower that they do it at the same time, and then uh, this uh, goes into male identity probably more likely than otherwise. Fascinating. Okay, before I go back to questions from the audience, Richard, the other question I asked Jutta while you were away is, um, if we don't want to sit here one year from now and talking about the same issues that we're talking today, what are the main lessons to be learned from this pandemic with so, regard to uh, impact on women? Well, I, I, from a policy perspective, um, I think the two big things are at the designing educational systems to align with labor markets um, so that we actually, the school day is an issue um uh, around kind of working day um and i think that they both should be more flexible in the positive sense <laughs> um but i just think again the the issue of we, we have recognized how important school is as a form of child care <laughs> all right and so i think we need to build on that and have extended school days more after school time etc to make it easier for parents to to work and then on the labor market side uh, obviously, I want paid leave in the US. I want uh, pater more generous paternity leave as well as maternity leave. But I also think it's really incumbent on institutions. I think that this moment of potential redesign to make for a, a, a work a trajectory that, that allows people to take two or three years out, as I did, right? And it not to derail their entire career, especially if they're in their 30s, you know, which is very often when this happens. Um, but that you can kind of catch up, right? There's a difference between being derailed onto a different track and just taking a bit of time out and getting back onto the same track, right? You might lose three years of earnings, but you haven't lost seven years of earnings because you took three years out, right? And I think that's the key is to try and get our labor market institutions redesigned. That's those, those would be the directions I would, I would push in. Well, I'm with him. Uh, yeah. What uh, parents now do is that they maximize the moment. They maximize those months in which the kid is small and they do not think what's going to happen in consequence of their decisions today in five or in 10 years. And if they would for a moment think about what does this mean for our future? And that the future looks quite different for women staying out for many years and looks exactly like the man envisioned if he continues to work, then decisions would be made differently in partnerships. I'm, con I'm absolutely convinced. Yeah, uh, building on that, there's a question, I might have just jumped, um, to Richard. How can we achieve the cultural changes that you're talking about, that's male identity and fatherhood? Roles and identity seem to persist. Would parental leave in the US work? That's very specific. Why wouldn't it? I don't know, would it work? Well, yes, it, it, it does work in the states yeah. where it's been introduced. We don't have a federal paid leave policy, but many states have leave policies in some cities, but, and uh, they do work. Um, the, the challenge is, and this relates to the first half of the question, is that um, they can also widen the gender pay gap. So in California, for example, a more generous paid leave policy widened the gender pay gap because the leave was taken entirely by women, uh, almost entirely by women, um, my mother's and um, employers began to uh, discriminate in advance, uh, if you like, so anticipatory discrimination. And so it actually had this, you know, so 
it worked as a care policy, but it didn't work as a gender equality policy. And so you have to be clear what your goal is uh, here. So um, it depends what you mean by work. <laughs> um, and I think the only way to make leave policy work for gender equality is to have more paternity leave, more use it or lose it, to focus more of it on men. But that's very controversial because a lot of women would argue that the men are going to waste it. And so we should be focusing the attention on women. But I think in the long run, um, the only way to change those norms is by pushing policy towards more paternity leave and so on. So that's how it will work for gender equality, um, even if it works for care. So it's one of these areas where you have to be really clear what the goal of the policy is before you can determine whether or not it's been successful. Um, so anyway. But I strongly it, underline this. Yes. I mean, right now, as I said before, we celebrate this home office. So if the goal of home office is that you increase the flexibility, uh, then of course, it's wonderful. Then go in this direction. But don't tell us that this will decrease gender uh, inequality. It won't. Uh, and uh, if you introduce uh, paid uh, parental leave and employers then know that women will interrupt, and even if a woman does not want to have children or can't have children, she will be treated as if she will have two or three kids, will interrupt and be this unreliable uh, workforce. Uh, and this is the statistical discrimination he was talking about, which we have you know, up and on, uh, in particular because men are not taking this leave for longer than those three months and together with women. Those as a reliable worker, I trust them, I invest in them, I give them further in, uh, education. But women are not reliable. Okay. You know, they can step out at any moment, at least until they are 40. Or, or and, other, in, in, you know, and otherwise, you know, then what? they are too old uh, for a career. We are coming to an end of a very, very lively debate. And um, now that you're with us, Richard, <laughs> I'd like to ask you, is there, is there one thing that you take out of that last hour that you really enjoyed or re you really wanted to um, comment on that Yuta said? Well, uh, a very specific thing is this idea of, you know, vouchers, the, you know, the economic, in changing the economic incentives for men to do work in the home. Uh, I think that's a very challenging idea and goes further than the one that I've talked about before. Um, I, I suppose for me, I just, the, I'm still in this I don't know stage, right? And I, I'm aware that I might be being too optimistic about some of the changes um, that we might see. But I also, my fear is fatalism. My fear is that we don't seize the opportunity. I think that there is everything to play for right now. We don't know yet what the impact is gonna be on racial equality, educational equality, labor market, we just don't know. And a lot depends on what we do now. And so I think we have a historic opportunity to take what has been an equity disaster and turn it into an equity triumph but it will require us to recognize that's possible. And I'm a bit worried about some of, the, some of this feels like, you know, some of the length, some of, what, some of what I read and hear is, we've lost 40 years of feminist progress. It's gonna be disaster for women. It's a very negative message and it may be true, but it seems to me that it's not true yet. <laughs> and maybe we can change it. Jutta, what do you think about that? One last brief message. You've well, uh, first of all, I would uh, agree saying, well, um, and, and also in this book, I, I very much closed with a positive ending saying, we know how to do it. We just have to do it. I mean, and this is a very comfortable position because we know in the direction which we have to go. And if you ask me what I have learned, the first thing which I will look up is university enrollment by gender uh, because I was not aware of this and I'm not sure whether this happened uh, undercover in Germany as well. That was new to me. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, Jutta. So um, this was a very, very brief, very lively and insightful discussion. I think, thank you both. Thank you, Jutta and Medina. Thank you for your moderation. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, apologies for the technical side. I think, oh, it, was, I think uh, it was on both sides, actually. Oh, it's, but, uh, um, it's one of the impacts of the <laughs> pandemic that we're dealing with those Wi-Fi issues <laughs> every now and then. Thank you, Richard, for, um, for being with us and coming back to us. <laughs>
And um, thank you to Villa Aurora and Thomas Mannhaus Verein for um, coming up with the idea and enabling us to do so for Witzet Bibel and Social Science Center for inviting us over here, for the American Council on Germany for also inviting us, and also thank you to you for spending the last hour or so with us and with Jutta and Richard, and um, thanks you, thank you for sharing your insights and writing all those wonderful comments to us. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you. Uh, probably together we will change it to a better. Yes, hopefully next time we can do this in person. But yeah. let's let's be optimistic let's, let's about, about the whole issue. And then we on other yes. social economic. You do, you do Germany, I'll do America. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. well, at least I'm optimistic. We won't be sitting here in a year from now and talking about the same issues. So that's that's good. <laughs> Thanks. Very good. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.